Welcome, everyone, to this week's episode of Encounter with God Together, our weekly audio and video podcast, where we review the readings in our daily Bible reading guide called Encounter with God. And each week I welcome a guest, <clears throat> and I'm happy to welcome you, Richard, this week. You're not a stranger you to much. this podcast. Richard is on our board and also pastors at church in New York State. And um, Richard, it's good to have you back again. Thank you. It's good to be back. Good. And um, I know we've, we're giving you, uh, we're, we're kicking off a new uh, series of readings this week in Second Samuel. Yes. So I'm going to pray for you as you get started. Father, I do pray for Richard, and I thank you for um, allowing him to bring your word to us now and to, um, to his own local congregation. I pray that you speak in and through him uh, to, today as he reads in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Yeah, it, it, it's 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 Second Samuel is is a continuation, really, of the David story, right? And the, the, it's hard to talk about Second Samuel without talking a little bit about First Samuel, because in First Samuel we we we, be, we see the beginning of king, kingship in Israel, mm. and you, and and Samuel, of course, who who is not the author of this text. Uh, it's written hundreds of years after the events that it recounts. But um, Samuel is a transitional figure. He's the last of the judges. He's a man deeply in tune with God. And he has a vision for Israel that doesn't involve a king. Because God is the king of Israel. Right. But when the people clamor for a king, God says, ah, give them what they want. And so they get Saul. But, but initially, he, 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 he cautions them. When you get a king, you have wars, you have taxes, you get all sorts of stuff that you may not like. Yeah. And, and so um, as kingship begins, you get Saul. And, and then Saul, the first king of, of Israel, is a deeply flawed and I would say tragic figure yes. who's um, plucked out of obscurity and, and becomes the king but is 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 destroyed really by his own jealousy uh, mm. jealousy of david david's really the central figure of both first and second samuel the, the the story is about david and that's why it's important for christians because this is the beginning of the line of david from which jesus emerges so Jesus is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant that you're going to find in uh, 2 Samuel 7, I think it is, verse 16 or something like that. Um, and, and, and so what is it that we can see about David that is a, is a take home for us? Because I think everything in scripture ought to be something that, that leads us in some way to personal wisdom and deeper faith. Mm. So, so um, the, the, the book starts with, with David learning of the death of Saul. Saul has been awful to David. You know, Saul has tried to kill David. Saul has destroyed uh, David's, David's life in many ways as much as he could. Uh, so, so David, f for, for years has been uh, an outlaw, pretty much, uh, running from the wrath of the king uh, who was jealous of him because of David's uh, prowess and popularity. So, so, so Saul has been David's nemesis. David could have killed him on a number of occasions mm -hmm. and didn't. And David didn't do that because David had profound respect for the anointed of God. And, and there's, there, I think, is a takeaway, too. Not everyone who, who is, is called by God to, to, to do some great thing is going to be perfect. We're going to find out in the second part of, of 2 Samuel, David's not perfect. David is also... Uh, plagued by his own weaknesses, but but David also has this 
this respect for God and, and those who are called by God and those who are acting on God's behalf. So, God, so uh, David, when he had the opportunity to kill Saul, didn't. Even though at, at some point in, in uh, 1 Samuel, uh, God makes the decision to uh, move on from Saul and to anoint David as king. So David, David becomes sort of the king. Um, it, 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 in the Catholic Church, sometimes the Pope will, will create a cardinal, they call it in pectore, because the cardinal, the, 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 the bishop who is being made a cardinal, the person who's being made a cardinal is in some country where there's persecution and being named the cardinal would put that person in jeopardy. So the Pope makes them a cardinal, but doesn't tell anybody about it. Um, I guess he must write it down someplace. Uh, in, in some ways, God makes David the king in pectore because, mm. he, because he doesn't immediately take Saul out of the picture. And, and David doesn't feel the right to do it, even though he's been attacked by Saul and, and persecuted by Saul and, 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 and have threatened by Saul. David doesn't feel the right to remove God's anointed because God put Saul in place. And it's, it's God's prerogative to decide when and how Saul would no longer be the king. Mm. So David has a respect for that. And, and you can see why David is a person after the Lord's own heart, right? Because he, he's got this profound respect for God and God's will. He also has a tenderness. That, I mean, he's a, a, a warrior king. But there's a tenderness about the way he, he, uh, he acts in, in some ways that makes him a very compelling and, and, and lovable guy. Mm. Um, so, so in the, in the, in the first chapter of, of second Samuel, uh, some, uh, young man from, uh, he's a, let me see, he's an Amalek, Amalekite. Um, and he comes along and, and brings David the news. Uh, David has just come back from battling as, as luck would have it, the Amalekites. Um, and, and he brings David the news that Saul has been killed in battle. The, the young man says, I just happened to be there. Uh, I saw he was dead. I got his crown. I got the thing he puts at his, his uh, arm bracelet. And I thought I'd bring it to you and let you know that, that he's dead. As a matter of fact, when I met him on the battlefield, the young man says, he wasn't quite dead. So he asked me to finish him off. And of course I did. Now this guy is probably, it, it's hard to say, there are a number of different um, explanations of how Saul died. Uh, and this is not compatible with the other ones. So it's, it's assuming there's some historical truth here. This is probably a young man who says, oh boy, uh, I, I struck it rich. Here's the dead king. Uh, I'll take his crown. I'll take his armband. I'll go to I'll go to David and I'll get a reward because David must hate the guy. I mean, look at how he's been treated. So he goes to David and he brings him the bad news. And it's interesting because David is genuinely crushed by the news. Hmm. He, he 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 does all of the things that would would d demonstrate grief. He tears his garments, and and, and <clears throat> I think that. What it shows is here's a guy who doesn't hold grudges. I mean, he he genuinely mourns someone who was really lousy to him, and who tried to kill him multiple times. And had he survived this battle, might try to kill him multiple times again. But David had faith in 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 God, and it's it's a faith that we also could take to the bank here because you don't see it in every great biblical figure. Uh, and you probably don't even see it in David consistently. Uh, but he let God fulfill God's promise in God's own way. And mm -hmm. so uh, he wasn't hostile to Saul. He wasn't hateful towards Saul. He was just genuinely concerned that the Lord's anointed had died in battle and he had been in some ways in David's eyes, at least a great man. 
Mm. So he had done things for, for the country. He had done things for its people. He had improved the economy. I, I, he'll go on in, in, a, in a, um, a little dirge that he writes at the end of the, of the chapter, the second half of the chapter, uh, to, to, to paint a beautiful picture of, of his respect for Saul. And, and I think, you know, we live in a world where we are, we are surrounded by division and hatred and, and backstabbing and all you have to do. I, don't, I, I hate watching the news because there's so much bad news. And, and I think this is a, a, a passage in scripture that reminds us that our, our call as believers is not to play the world's game the way the world plays it, uh, but to rise above the hatred and be loving even towards people who are not terribly loving towards us. And that's what David does here um, mm. towards, towards Saul. Um, and the, the other thing he does is he, he honors Jonathan, who was genuinely his friend. Because Jonathan, who was Saul's son, Saul's oldest son, and who also perished in this battle, um, was somebody that David genuinely loved. You know, with, with a, a beautiful tenderness that, that, that um, I mean, you write at the end, um, how the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of a woman. So, uh, you know, what's he saying there? He's saying that there was something so beautiful. I mean, you can think of, uh, you know, comrades in battle who become so close to each other. Some of these old geezers who, who served in World War II. And, and they, they, they do become, what the, in uh, um, Stephen Ambrose's phrase, a, a band of brothers, and 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 here David is saying, look, more more than the love of a woman. Well, that's wife, mother, all all the the female roles that can be in a man's life, and he's saying this this brother of mine was so important to me. Jonathan saved his life on many occasions, uh, mm. and defi and defied his father, and and so David is is showing his tremendous respect and love for that friend of his who also died. So David is in genuine grief. And, um, you know, I, I think the take home for us is, is that, that that love is something that we can cherish in David, uh, but, but try to incorporate in our own lives because, because David's love for his friend and love for his enemy uh, are both profoundly and beautifully expressed in this first chapter of Samuel. Very good. The the Amalekite didn't end, didn't fare so well <laughs> because because we and, and and I I don't think I would have done this over David, but hey, uh, David believed that the Amalekite who said he killed. Saul, at Saul's request, but killed him nonetheless, um, had confessed to the sin of killing God's anointed. And he had such respect for Saul, even, even the, the, the Saul who uh, was a, a shadow of his, of his former self, that he has the, the Amal Amalekite uh, taken out and executed for killing the king. So mm. that is not the way he thought that was going to go. No, I think he thought he was going to get a few, uh, few prizes for that. Mm. But, but then as we move into the book, I, I, do, do we have, do I have much more time? I, I don't want to. Yeah, sure. As we move further into the book, we see what, what happens next is, is, is David becomes the king. He gets anointed. He becomes the king of first of Judah and they anointed the, and he, he makes his capital in Hebron. Or Hebron, and um, and and you see the consolidation. David is now given what God has promised, and he's he's given the kingship, mm. and 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 he does what is favorable in the eyes of God, 
he he um, he promises to build a temple. God says, "Yeah, I have, I have a, I've been living in this tent for so long." Um, and David says, "I'll I'll build you a temple." Um, and, and God smiles on that. I mean, it's, it's not going to happen until Solomon's king, but but um, he takes the ark and he brings it to Jerusalem. He, he becomes the king of the United Kingdom of Judah and Israel. And that, that's the, the, the process of consolidation. But what is it? It's God doing what God has promised to do. So I think, again, what do we find there? We've, when God promises things, he's not messing around. And we, we, we screw things up when we try to accomplish what God has promised he would do. Right. Because God doesn't need our help. <laughs> he just wants us to stay out of his way. And, and uh, there, there are you know, many other examples in, in scripture, in you know, the Old Testament in particular, of people who get you know, wonderful promises. And then they say, well, you know, let me try to do it my way. Or I'm not seeing how God's getting this done. Uh, so let me, uh, let me take a few steps to, to help God along. And, and David doesn't do that. He doesn't kill Saul. He doesn't seize the crown. He, instead, he, um, he, he allows God in God's own time to do what God has promised to do. And he becomes the king of Israel and, 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 and the forebearer of, of Jesus. I mean, the, the, probably the central part of, of um, 1 Samuel is the chapter 7 where um where god makes a covenant with david and he says he says the lord declares to you that the lord himself will establish a house for you when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors i will raise up your offspring to succeed you your own flesh and blood and i will establish his kingdom he is the he is the one who will build a house for my name i will and i will establish um, the throne of his kingdom forever and i will be his father and he will be my son when he does wrong i will punish him with the rod with floggings inflicted by human hands but my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever more. Before me, your throne will be established forever. And this is this is God speaking through Nathan the prophet to, to, to David. What's he promising? He's saying this your house will bless all nature i i see jesus written all over that you know he'll be called my son you know he'll your kingdom will be established forever the fulfillment of that promise is our christ god fulfills promises that's the takeaway amen Amen. Thank you, Richard. Would you would you pray for those of us who are going to be doing more uh, in-depth looking at this this week? I would be happy to. Creator God, bless every person who encounters God this week through the ministry of Scripture Union. Give each person praying reflecting and reading and acting. Give them wisdom that comes from your spirit. Open their hearts and, and give them a firm desire to be like David, people of your own heart. And, and help us to see in, in our reflections on David in, in 2 Samuel, help us to see the beginnings of the house from which Jesus comes for he is the son of David and the son of God. We make this prayer in his name through the power of the spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for those it's thoughts. And my pleasure. Glad to, <laughs> glad, to, glad to be with you.
Good to be with you too. And you have a great week. You too. God bless you. God bless you. God bless all you watching. Take Bye care. For now. Thanks everybody. Bye now.